you see fit. Doesn't mean I have to be, but I am. Hi, thank you for that applause. And it's wonderful to see you here. I'm Robert McBride. Over here we have the guest conductor for tonight's concert, making his Oregon Symphony debut, Christopher Klux. My U.S. debut, actually. The U.S. debut. Yeah. You were in Los Angeles a few years ago, but just assisting. Yeah, but I did conduct three concerts there, but it was it was um, it was not in the main season. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And someone you may be familiar with, Gabriel Kahane. Yay, see, they're familiar with Gabriel Kahane, who will be composer and performer tonight. And we may talk a little bit about your role as creative chair now with the Oregon Symphony and the upcoming events that you'll have. And look at that classic old Fender guitar. How old is that thing? Truth be told, I'm actually borrowing that jazz master from a buddy of mine who lives here, but there's a story to this guitar, which is that the piece on which I'll be playing it, Empire Liquor Mart, was recorded on Orcas Island six years ago on that guitar, which, it, which does not belong to me. So, so I, don't, I don't know how old it is, but I have a little bit of a history with it. That, that's, it looks old. reunited with it this week for the yeah. first time. So you'll years. be playing guitar and piano tonight. I'm going to try. <laughs> and doing music that originally involved those instruments, but not an orchestra. So the bulk of what we're doing, um, the world premiere of a suite called Pattern of the Rail, is a set of orchestrations of songs from an album called Book of Travelers, which um, I wrote, oh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Um, this is success. This is a, I'm considering a success to have one person know the record. Um, the album was written in response to the 2016, well, a train trip that I took beginning the morning after the 2016 presidential election. You're going to have to hear me say this twice, because I'm going to say it when everyone else shows up as well. Um, basically, I was trying to... Uh, we'll save that for the, for the actual concert. What I will tell you now is that the particular challenge is that Book of Travelers was written for piano and voice, nothing else. Um, incredibly delicate, uh, fragile little songs, just a single voice and a single accompanying instrument. And so the challenge with orchestrating these was to try to preserve the intimacy and, and the emotional character of them while adding 75 musicians. <laughs> The other thing that we're doing, Empire Liquor Mart, which comes from an album called The Ambassador, was on, you know, in its original form, recorded with 12 string players, five brass players, guitar, bass, drums. This is definitely a, a rather substantial expansion of, of the original, but it's a little bit more in the spirit of how it was intended uh, compared to the Book of Travelers tunes. Well, to what extent did you do any rewriting, or did you just take this chord and put it with these instruments? There's a lot of, the way I think about arranging my own songs, I, you know, I, I kind of live this double life with the phone booth where I'm a singer-songwriter and then I go into the phone booth and I change and I come out and I'm you know, wearing a suit and hanging out with this guy. <laughs> um, but the way I think about arranging my songs is it's almost as though the, the song is a pencil sketch and the orchestration is, is the color. And so it's. Not I don't really agree on that. Oh, because let's you, say more. There are so. It's it's not just just colors. It's also new comments to the text, in my opinion. I I totally agree. There's there the 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 orchestration is responding to the text. When I say color, I guess what I mean is it could be new counterpoint. It could be. Um, tones that aren't in the original chord that, f that further color the sense of the harmony. But it's it more the, the, the metaphor that I'm looking for is just that you write a song and it's not necessarily fully vivid. And then you start adding color, counterpoint, so on and so forth. So these are not just, um, you, you, you could, I suppose in one sense, you could put a piece of tracing paper over the orchestration and they would sort of look the same, but... <laughs> Yes and no. <laughs> I'm interested in the title you chose when you decided to arrange six of these for orchestra. You gave this collection the title Pattern of the Rail, singular, Patterns of the Rail, singular. Why aren't those plural? There's a lyric in one of the songs. Actually, the truth is I crowdsourced the title from my Facebook page. 
I said, does anyone have an idea of what to call this suite? And someone said, pattern of the rail, and I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> so that's, how, that's where it came from. Does this someone get royalties? That we're negotiating. As you should. As you should be. So, Christopher Klukson, when Christian. did Christian. When, when did I'm sorry? When did you see this music for the first time, Gabriel's music? A couple of months ago, something like that. Yeah. And you, I assume, were involved in the programming of this concert. So you wanted to do Prokofiev Five and. There's always, when you negotiate uh, uh, an engagement with an orchestra, there is always more or less um, a fixed uh, part of the program where the orchestra will go to you and say, uh, so this is what we really want to do and make something f fit around it. Mm. So I got more or less the freedom to comment on Gabriel's music in the rest of the program. And that was um, a very difficult task because the program was, was put together much, uh, much before I even knew anything about Gabriel's music, how it sounds, what, what the... Um, uh, what and you were the you were skeptical. I was I was skeptical because I went uh, immediately online and and listened to some of your music and I thought, how is this guy going to make this uh, fit into a symphonic program? How can he make an orchestra speak with this material? Uh, and I kind of just said, okay. In the end, I said, okay, yeah, let's try it. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes you have to trust the people uh, in the orchestra who... Uh, and I knew that Gabriel is the new creative chair of the orchestra, so I thought it can't be that bad. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's bad, but it's not, it can't it's be not that, that bad. bad. Yeah. Right. And, um, it's it, not great. It's not great, but <laughs> it's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. And it was... Uh, then when I got the score, I, th I thought... Phew, you know... <laughs> um, and then uh, only... The, but just before I came here, um, having studied Gabriel's scores and and uh, knowing the Beethoven and and uh, uh, Prokofiev, uh, I f I found out how how um, very well these pieces go together. Did anything have to be changed in rehearsal, in, in your music? Oh, for sure. It's any time you're doing new new music. Um, there are always negotiations. Negotiation seems to be the theme of this evening. Um, it's it's a, one of the benefits of having worked with this orchestra before um, and one of the benefits of this orchestra being so incredibly generous, uh, generous of spirit and really just wanting things to be as good as they can be with really no ego is that they will, you know, members of the orchestra will approach you and say, you know, I think you're going for this. What if I used this mute instead of this mute? Or they'll say, is it okay if I start on this string instead of this string when I'm playing this note? Um, so, you know, I, I, nothing really substantive changed. We had one, one little um, magical um, metric rewriting. It's, it's very in the weeds, but we, we basically changed the way something is counted and it made it a lot easier. Um, and you know, we, I, I, t I tend to take things out, particularly when it's vocal music. There's the constant struggle is, on the one hand, you want the text to really come through, and that means keeping the texture fairly sparse. And on the other hand, you don't want the orchestra to be bored, so you want, have, you want them to have things to do. <laughs> so that's, that's the other negotiation. How many of you were here for Gabriel's wonderful piece, Emergency Shelter Intake Form? Well, of course you were. You're his biggest fan ever. Yeah. That was such an amazing and wonderful experience. It was, it was thrilling, it was funny, it was disturbing, and it was recorded. Yay, so when will that CD be out? Uh, I can't tell you the exact date, but it will be out, I would say, in the first quarter of next year. Great. Yeah. yeah. I'm definitely going to want to have that one. It'll be fun to hear it again. How are you doing with 
all of the different things that you have to do and that you juggle, especially since now you're a, a father, you have a, a young child, but you have all these commissions and all these performances and you go here and you go there, you still seem like you're a very down-to-earth, nice kind of guy. So it's not getting to you or do you take it out on the dog or what? No, you have a cat. Have you have a cat. a cat. I definitely don't take it out on the cat. The cat takes it out on me. Now, I, you know... I, um, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. I guess, I guess I feel like life is too short to be anything other than down to earth. I don't know what being not down to earth would, mm -hmm. would look like, but I think, you know, Christian made some beautiful um, connections, which we'll speak about. I don't want to spoil what he's going to say to the full audience later, but just to say that um, this entire program is really about celebrating human spirit, human resilience, the way that um, the human spirit evolves through the changing of place and how we know, know ourselves better as we navigate the world and move around physically or emotionally. Um, and so I guess to the extent that I'm, as an artist, kind of preoccupied with getting inside the experience of people uh, whose lives are not like my own, um, as a way of then sharing that with, with an audience, and, and trying to help all of us to be a little bit more expansive in, in, in our sense of generosity. Um, I guess, I, I, yeah, I just, I, I, I feel like I wanna, I wanna model in life what I'm trying to achieve in my, in my work. And I don't think it's, I don't think it works to, you know, make, make music or make any kind of art that is um, psychologically sensitive and then be an asshole in life. <laughs> I bet your mother would agree. She's a mental health professional. Yes. You have a couple of good role models there in, in mom and dad. So here we get a sense of, of Gabriel Cahane as, as a nice man, as somebody who's present, can communicate well. So the good news is, in the two concert series that you will now be doing for the Oregon Symphony, you'll be doing this. It's true. Yeah, I have, um, I have this new role of creative chair in which I'm starting two two concert series um, in addition to working with Charles Calmer, the brilliant vice president for artistic planning, um, without whose uh, vision so little of what, what you experience here would, would happen. He, he's really, he's a hero um, and really just phenomenally intelligent. He went, went and found Christian in Victoria and said, this guy needs to come conduct our orchestra. And it's wonderful to, to have him here. Uh, one of the, con the series that we're going to do is called Open Music, and that will debut March 13th at the Alberta Rose Theater with um, Caroline Shaw. These will be sort of composer portraits, composer conversations. Caroline won the Pulitzer Prize at age 30. She has also worked with Kanye West. She is one of the kindest, gentlest people I know, and, and uh, an incredible spirit, incredibly charismatic. She sings with Room Full of Teeth. Uh, she's also an extraordinary violinist, and we will be doing a short-ish program of chamber music, some by her, some by our contemporaries, some by Schubert, some by Brahms, some by Paul Simon. This is very expansive programming as a way of looking inside her head and seeing what is it that makes her tick. Um, and then we'll continue with three more of those in the 2021 season. And then we're also doing um, a, a series still to be named that sort of in the spirit of bridging the, the two worlds that I inhabit, the, the world of being a songwriter and the world of being a, a composer, we're gonna invite songwriters um, much more popular than I am to collaborate with composers and orchestrators to create new work um, for this concert hall. And uh, you'll, you'll learn more about that in the, in the months to come. If you haven't been to the Alberta Rose Theater, I really recommend going there. It's a wonderful venue, very comfortable, cozy, and you can drink and eat, if you wish. So, Christian Kluxen, how did Charles Calmer find you, do you know? Was it word of mouth? Somebody told him, hey, you should check out this guy in Victoria. I don't know. He was there for one of my concerts and, and uh, asked me to come here. Uh, I don't know how he heard of me, really. He's kind of a headhunter. He, he flies all over the place 
and you call him and he's like, oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in Austria watching a conductor, or I'm, I'm in Victoria watching a conductor. We don't know how he does it. He doesn't reveal his methods. Are you happy to be here? I'm extremely happy to be here. Yeah, what do you think of our little city so far? I think it's very, very vibrant. I, um, I went down by the water. Uh, it's, um, it's really, really, really wonderful moving um, uh, to walk there and just be in the sun the other day uh, before we started rehearsals. I really needed that. Um, uh, to um, do a bit about my jet lag. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. How is rehearsing with an American orchestra different than rehearsing a European orchestra? To the extent that you can generalize. Well, whenever I conduct an orchestra, I never think about nationality. I try not to. But afterwards, of course, I, 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 it, well, I cannot say that if, if this is a typical American orchestra, of course. But I can say that they, um, in Europe there are, as you know, of course, many different traditions. Uh, and this is how our orchestra sounds. Uh, th there is to a certain extent also that in America with, uh, with a, a few orchestras in, in, in America. Um, but I think that uh, what I experience here is that there is, there is nothing in the, the musicians that says, this is not how we do it. We we don't do it in the way in the way that you uh, suggest. So so just you know, <laughs> um, they're very flexible. They're very flexible, and they are very open. And if if I ask them to do something, not only are they extremely capable of doing it, but they are also open to just doing it. Yeah, I've heard other people say that about this orchestra. It's really gratifying. I mean, if for example, some of the orchestras, in, if you take Concertgebouw or uh, Wiener Philharmonica or something like that, you know, they have a very, if you go into the Vienna Philharmonic and you, you start a Brahms symphony and then you stop after five bars. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, 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 I mean, there are, there are, you know, not happy with you. There, well, I mean, I heard from one of my, my friends, um, you know, uh, he, he, he tried to, to comment on something in a, in a Brahms symphony and the horn player came to, uh, to him and he said, well, uh, it says this in the music and he could see that it had all these dates going all the way back to Brahms and then uh, one of the notes about this passage said, uh, Dr. J.B. And that was Johannes Brahms, of course. He had made a comment which was against what my colleague he, he asked for. <laughs> so, you know, and another of my colleagues, he went and he was, he was stepping in to conduct Salome with the uh, Wiener Staatsoper. And he was very, it starts with a clarinet, you know, something. And, and it's a bit difficult to conduct that beginning. And he went down to the clarinets and he said, hey, I'm, I'm going to do like this and then I'm going to do like this. And then he, they said, make a movement and we play Salome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so, you know, uh, in, in, that, in that sense, you can say that um, American orchestras are much more open. It, it, of course, there's not this big tradition in all of the American orchestras, but uh, they, they say, let's, let's just do it. Let's try it. I, w I would say, having worked with not a ton of American orchestras, but this is your debut, so I have a few more under my belt, um, that I think the Oregon Symphony is unique in, in the quality of its musicianship and the, the flexibility. That you go to some, some orchestras around the country that also play well, and they're, they're a little more jaded. They, they say, eh, it's, and, and they don't carry that tradition of this is the sound. It's more like we're just here to work. <laughs> And you don't get that here at all. But there's also th th this type of orchestras in, in, in Europe, trust me. Yeah. How was it with the CSO when you did the uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra when you did your emergency intake shelter? Oh, uh, yeah, emergency shelter intake form. After it was done here, it was done in Chicago at Grant Park. What did they think it, of it? It was actually not with the Chicago Symphony. It was with uh, the Grant Park Festival Orchestra. Um, they, it was 
it was warmly received there, um, a very different experience. It was a little more compressed time-wise, um, but it was really special to do it in that space in Millennium Park with the beautiful Frank Geary Amphitheater um, outside, you know, free concert. I felt it was very much in the spirit of, of the piece. Yes. A question about Denmark and bicycles. Portland likes to brag that it's a great city for bike riders. Uh, we hear a lot about Denmark with, with roads that are just for bicycles. And, but do people ride in the winter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad clothing. Yes. <laughs> and do you ride? All the time. Yeah, we, we, I mean, all, practically all our roads are a bit... Uh, are not as wide as here because we have, uh, a, a, you can say, segregated uh, bicycle lane on each side where the, so the, the uh, what can you say, um, the cars can't just drive into the bicycle lane. It's a bit higher than... We're the, starting to do that here a little mm, bit. Mm, yeah, so, yeah, that in that sense, that's... But it's been that, like that for forever. You, if you see old movies from Cop Copenhagen, from uh, the beginning of, of previous century, uh, there are tons of bicycles. It's, it's um, yeah. Good. It can be difficult to find a parking spot for your bicycle in Copenhagen. That's true. There is a delightful Danish opera called Masquerade by Carl Nielsen, which is never performed in this country because I guess we just don't do Danish opera here. Have you ever conducted that piece? I have conducted larger sections of it. Mm -hmm. It's not that much performed either in, in, in Denmark, maybe, I don't know, once every uh, eight year or something like that. It's, it's quite funny, but I have to say it's not his masterpiece, but it is good, it is fun. What is his masterpiece in your opinion? Or one or two of them? I would say uh, one of his. Sim I would say his fourth symphony is 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 his masterpiece. Um, it, it's just so crazy uh, and uh, and has inspired a lot of other composers as well. Also, his fifth symphony. I, yeah, maybe also his third symphony. <laughs> um, the fifth is the one that's played the most here. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay, it's the most violent of them. Yeah, that's why we do it the most here. Okay, great. <laughs> so I have an idea for that crazy snare drum solo in Nielsen 5 next time you do it because there's this the composer asks the snare drummer to be disruptive to just do whatever you want to do on this thing and try to disrupt the music so what I would like to see is the guy really gets carried away and gets really angry and frustrated and kicks the drum over and leaves the stage well you can do all kinds of stuff but you know I think uh, I think recently a Finnish conductor called Leif Sikerstam, uh, that you might know, he, um, he, he is um, a character, as you say here, <laughs> uh, a big personality, uh, and a strong personality, and he had the drummer um, wear a clown uniform. I like it. Yeah, I don't know if I like it, but <laughs> <laughs> I, it's certainly a, a, a new thing. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff like that, but we just I think we just have to remember that Nielsen was very specific that his music is not program programmatic in that sense um, so uh, so to a certain extent i think it's I, I I like your idea, but it has to be done delicately i think uh, speaking of percussion, there is a magnificent forty four inch tam tam sitting off stage just now. Tam Tam looks like a gong. We tend to call them gongs, but they're flat. And we're going to hear that in Prokofiev 5 tonight. One of the great moments in music history happened at the premiere of Prokofiev 5. Are you going to talk about that before you conduct today? Uh, not specifically. I think I know what you are, are, are fishing for. So you're gonna, uh, you want to tell that story now because it's just yeah, so Yeah, well, well it, was, it was first performed, um, I can't remember the exact date, but in, in 1944. And it was, it was just when um, the Russians uh, had moved into Germany. So in some way there was a, there was a sense in, in, in Russia that, that the, the tides had changed. Um, and uh, Prokofiev, he conducted the premiere, and just when he 
uh, lifted his arms to start the symphony, uh, you heard the bombing outside the hall. Uh, and, and, and he took down his hands again and waited for the bombing to stop. And then he took up again and then he started the symphony. Uh, and in that perspe perspective, I mean, there are so many incredible stories about this uh, symphony. Um, Prokofiev had uh, traveled uh, the years before the symphony was composed. Uh, to, uh, he went to, um, to uh, America, uh, he went to New York, uh, he lived in France for a while, and, but he got homesick. Um, and that combined with the fact that Stalin, he said to him, if you come back to Russia, I will give you an apartment, a waiter, a driver, a car, and, um, and steady commissions. Uh, he went back to Russia. And the um, fact is that f around four years later, after this symphony, he was on pretty good terms with the regime in, in, in Russia. But it, Stalin became, I think you can say, more and more crazy over the years. And uh, he quite er earlier, he, uh, what do you say when, when a composer is pushed away and said that this is not good? Um, nowadays we would say cancelled. Yeah, cancelled, yeah. <laughs> so, so he cancelled uh, Shostakovich a bit earlier. But Prokofiev also got cancelled and he, he was stunned that he was cancelled. But Prokofiev went back to... Uh, he went back to Russia, and when you hear this symphony, uh, you would probably agree that it could not have been uh, written like it is without him having experienced America, for example, or France, for, for that sake. The second movement starts with this... And I, I cannot see how it can be anything else than a car in New York going past. And there are so many things about that. Um, he went back to Russia with his wife, who was Spanish, uh, and um, she didn't want to go back to Russia. She hated it. So uh, they, they, they got divorced, and a few years later she was sent to a gulag, and she stayed there until, until I think, 53. But, on, but still after Prokofiev's death, she spoke well about him. That's a crazy story, I think. Yeah, she, she, was, she was convicted of spying. Lots of crazy stuff. Everyone was right on. spying. And then apparently. Stalin and Prokofiev died on the same day yeah, in 1953. Exactly. That's also crazy. Crazy. But, and Stalin got, of course, this big funeral, and Prokofiev's funeral had almost no flowers at all. So everyone, no flowers yeah, left. And, yeah, yeah, and he was he was apparently he, he he lied there for several days before they did anything because they everyone was so uh, it was all about Stalin's death, right? So uh, yeah. we have to stop. Really glad you're here. This concert is going to be very interesting. It's going to be very good, and I'm glad that you are both going to talk to the full audience when yes. they are here. We've sa we're saving all the good stuff for a few minutes from now, but this right. has been a pleasure. <laughs> Christoph Kluxen and Gabriel Kahane, thank you. <laughs>